Welcome to the recording of the Nature Plus Symposium Carbon Capture and Storage for Free, which was part of the Nature Plus European event series How to Build Climate Protection. Thank you for watching. Let me very shortly introduce Nature Plus for all uh, that are not familiar with our work. So we are an, we are the International Association for Sustainable Building and Living. We are a non-profit environmental association and a member-based network, actually. We are working and engaging for sustain, sustainable building sector. So we are convinced that for climate protecting, the topic of for today, resource saving, also kind of a topic for today in healthy building and living the material we choose, we all choose and use are key. So that's the main goal of our activity. Our members are from all over Europe and all relevant areas of the construction sector. And actually what you see here on the left side, these are also like the partners of this event series here today. We provide knowledge and helpful contacts um, and also offer advantages with our Nature Plus Eco label and the network for planners, retailers, manufacturers, all um, persons and all organizations that are dealing with sustainable construction. We are always happy if you want to get involved within the Nature Plus network, feel free to contact us, become a member, subscribe our newsletter with um, recent latest information monthly we send free become a sponsor for our events and if you have an own project that would you would like to discuss with us um just get in contact with us you're always invited um i really would like to express my sincere thanks to our sponsors as you might all know um their support makes it possible for us to put on such a comprehensive series of events so thank you very much to to Balfritz and to Gutex for this support. We host this um, European event series together with the ASPP, Acrodome, EOS, EBO, FIBO, also with Baubio Swiss and Green Register. And now <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this um, European best practice learning and expert lectures we have today. And finally, I may give the word to Anna Braunen. Hello, welcome from my side. Um, so I am Anna Braune. I'm head of uh, research and development at the German Sustainable Building Council, DGNB. I'm super happy to, to do the moderation. Um, usually I talk, now I can listen and I'm super interested in, to, in learning uh, from um, the panelists today. And um, the um, whole exercise is uh, actually to talk about carbon capture and storage for free. Um, the um, symposium is on bio-based building materials and we want to share European best practices and knowledge. Um, the program of, ah, no, first of all, um, yeah. So the program of today is actually, I'm the moderator. We will have a fantastic keynote of two speakers. Um, it's on the Bauhaus der Erde. Um, it is a very new initiative um, um, which uh, might um, change a lot uh, in Europe as well. We have uh, Professor Jürgen Kropp. Um, he is strategic advisor and partner of the Bauhaus der Erde G G GmbH, G GmbH. And, um, head of the urban transformations at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and Mark Weisgerber, co-founder and partner of Bauhaus der Erde. So, and with this um, keynote, I just have to look, we have the icebreaker, right, uh, Tillman? After yeah. the keynote, um, we will have, I'm talking about the program, please click uh, one session, which is on tools. We will have three presentations um, on different approaches from uh, Dr. Norton, Elodie Massé, and Simone Skalitsky. Then we have a short uh, break. Um, after the break, we have another session, which is on policy. I'm uh, looking forward to have Mati Kuitanen from Finland um, talking about the Finnish uh, approaches, um, Roel Ball from the Netherlands, and Magali de Prost from um, the Wallonian um, Public Service. 
And the last session is on materials. And um, I'm happy to have Rainer Blum and Dagmar Fritz Kramer uh, with us today. And uh, Rainer Blum will talk about bio-based material and Dagmar Fritz Kramer on, I think, the strategy on uh, their prefab um, housing um, company. And after that, we have discussions, time for questions, and um, we will look at the chat. Um, this is the program. And um, but to understand who you are, um, we have a little question to you: uh, What your on your professional background? Um, Tillman, can you do this? So there's a window popping up now, and you uh, should answer on your professional background. We wait a few seconds, not a full minute, because I think this seems to be easy. So nearly, we have two thirds who already participated, 80%. Tillman, we have other fields. So 80% of the people answered. Um, they are, we do have some students, architects and develop uh, building materials um, and other fields. Okay, I yeah. think. <laughs> right, interesting. So maybe um, all the attendees that uh, put other fields um, would be very interesting to know um, in which context you're working. So uh, feel free to use the chat and just put uh, the sector you're working in. Or maybe it's an NGO or something else we, we haven't named would be very interesting for us to know, maybe also for the for the speakers who they are addressing today. Thank you. Good. And this now leads uh, to our two um, keynote speakers. Um, Professor Jürgen Kropp is starting um, from the renowned um, Potsdam Institute for um, uh, Climate Impact Research. I have to <laughs> recall the English name of it. And um, there he is head of um, transformation. I think uh, Professor Kropp is talking about the imperative of um, uh, uh, generating, um, uh, of course, resource, <laughs> reducing carbon emissions, but also generating capture and storage possibilities. And then we have Mark Weisgerber. He was uh, uh, managing director and CFO of uh, Viola, Violia Germany and um, the Climate Kick um, um, Institute. Um, and now he's co-founder and partner of the Bauhaus der Erde. And he will talk about more a little bit about the Bauhaus der Erde and um, other aspects, as I heard. So I hand over to you, Professor Kropp, and then Mark Weisgerber. One moment. Yeah, hello, uh, everybody. So I hope you can hear me. Loud and, and clearly. Uh, OK, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so where is my, oh, sorry, again. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. So, uh, what? So, I will share my presentation or the time for my presentation with Mark, who uh, comes uh, afterwards, um, and I will talk a little bit about the general framing, so to say, uh, in other words, where we are and and what we have to do, and in particular in regard to timber construction, carbon storage. Um, so, you all know that we are facing. The Still facing the climate crisis, unfortunately, um, although uh, we have a little bit of superposition in, uh, in the moment with the COVID-19 um, pandemics and also with the recession. But when these two events are over, then we will definitely go back to the to the to the climate uh, change challenges. Yeah, when it comes to um, timber construction and carbon storage, then we should be aware that forests, of course, have a strong or not, not strong, a very, very big potential to, to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and binding, uh, binding it into, uh, uh, yeah, into bi bi biogenic materials, so in the timber, uh, for example. But this is not uh, really, really astonishing. So this is what we know since since decades now. And uh, without any of the forests, the climate crisis would have been even, even more uh, disastrous. And um, therefore, when we talk about uh, carbon storage potential for free and, and timber construction, we have always to take into account that we are talking about uh, additionality principles, so to say. 
yeah, when it comes to climate change, you may might be aware of of, uh, of a series um, of events, um, and I will like to bring one in in, in or will focus on one in particular, namely the Atal disaster, which took place in June 2021 this year with the death toll of approximately 200 people. Um, so what you can see now is that the climate change is accelerating and that uh, our modern infrastructure could be heavily affected. And when we talk about biogenic material, we have also to take into account that in the future, when we switch from, let's say, more mineralic construction to more biogenic construction, then we have to take into account also that, that these biogenic infrastructure need to be risk resilient. Uh, risk resilient, so to say. Okay, yeah, so what happened um, in, in Ata, you may see here, and, and uh, how the situation is in the moment, uh, you may also see by these uh, examples. So we had uh, several 100 year events, 100 year floods. Um, yeah, every 10 years, we can say. And here with Ata, uh, we, we have now, or we know now that that uh, we had also a failure of, of risk warning systems, uh, what is a pity indeed, but uh, even when, when they would have worked uh, properly, the damages to the infrastructure would have been uh, tremendous anyway. Yeah, so um, when we talk about urban cities or urban systems as such, um, so then we should be aware that uh, cities produce uh, approximately 80 well, 5% of our global GDP occupies just 3 to 4% of land, use 75% uh, of all resources and produce also 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And um, uh, in this, we have uh, approximately 40% uh, related to the, to the built environment. So cities are the, uh, the focal point of human activities, but also create a lot of uh, environmental damages in, in particular in regard to the climate and when you really take take it um, serious then the or the solution of the climate crisis needs to go through cities and um, when you take into account that build the built environment is responsible for almost 40 percent of the emissions then of course you should take yeah, you should think about new materials or new construction ideas and another example how climate change might affect cities you see here. So this is based on a, a series of simulations which we did for 150 cities in, in Central Europe and worldwide. And you see that the number of heat waves are already quite high. So uh, in cities, uh, densely populated areas, uh, they are almost a double in comparison to the, uh, to the, to the surroundings. And this could even become more worse when we proceed with the global warming as projected. <clears throat> so one reason why we have so much heat burden in cities comes from the fact that we, again, using the wrong material. So the old concrete and, and steel and so on are materials which have a high uh, heat storage capacity. And this also can be changed if you use uh, <clears throat> use timber buildings, for example, because they have very, very good isolation properties. Yeah, um, uh, this is also something what we have to think or we have to think about this issue a little bit in the tradition of the Bauhaus, because the Bauhaus uh, ended up with this Le Corbusier style of brutalism. So this is, of course, not what we like to see anymore. But uh, uh, from the very beginning, the Bauhaus idea was a bit different. Uh, so uh, it tried to bring together working and, and living and also wanted to ensure to create uh, affordable housings. But this is what Mark will take up later on. I will talk about uh, the potentials for timber buildings. Here you see some, some nice examples. The biggest one here is from Norway, 84 meters high and has 18 floors. Here are a few other examples. So timber buildings um, are built um, around the globe now increasingly, and this is a good issue. But um, before we go into a little bit more details, we should also lose some words about the cement industry, uh, because uh, in many, many discussions, um, People yeah, just tell you, okay, so the reason why we should, should substitute cement by, by timber is indeed uh, that they are emitting a lot of carbon dioxide. 
when you look on the global production of cement, uh, then you may see that cement as such is only responsible for seven to eight percent of the global emissions, which is around 2.7 to 3.1 gigatons carbon dioxide. Um, the reason um, why so much emissions are released by, by, by cement has to do with the production cycle. So in principle, we are using carbon carbonate and energy in order to separate one molecule carbon dioxide from it in order to obtain lime. So lime is then as a as the main material used in Portland cement. So, and this is done in so-called rotary kilns. Um, and these are the process emissions. Uh, so these emissions are based to 70, yeah, uh, between 70 and 80% on, on the energy, which, which we need to use to, to, to force this process. Normally, when you use it in, in a traditional way uh, and, and you are mixing mortar, for instance, then uh, cement, and mortar, uh, cement and water takes up this released uh, carbon dioxide molecule. Yeah? And that means mortar is not so um, carbon dioxide efficient, so to say, or negative. But uh, what we do when we use concrete, we add silicium oxide. And here, in this case, the CO2 remains in the atmosphere. And this is the major, major approach how we use uh, cement um, in, in the construction um, uh, business, so to say. But that's not all. You have also to add CO2. And for one cubic meter of concrete, which has a weight of around 2.6 tons, at the end, um, this, this material is responsible for 420 kilograms of carbon dioxide, and so which comes here from the processing, and then 180 kilograms, which comes from steel production. And if the cement industry would have been a country, then they are coming on the first, on the third place. So that makes clear the, the challenge of this, um, this mission, so to say. Uh, here you see already a comparison uh, between cement and uh, multi-laminated timber. So laminated timber has also um, yeah, uh, several, other several other benefits. Um, for instance, the weight factor is just one quarter in comparison to concrete. Yeah? So um, um, that means you need only one quarter of the material for yeah, constructing one square meter in comparison to concrete. Um, the fire resistance is nowadays quite good, uh, and the steel you can also, so the, the steel you may, may need, you can also reduce at least by 20%, if not more. And the whole transport which you needed for, for moving um, or for transporting the uh, construction material from, from the uh, factory or from the, from, uh, the forest to the, to the construction site can also be reduced by 90%. In Germany, we have at the moment an annual yield of 76 million cubic meters of timber. So one third of it is lawn timber. I will show you in a minute what this means in terms of uh, dwelling units. So when we come to the timber construction uh, business in, in Germany, we have in the moment for um, family houses, and uh, yeah, the percentage of 23 uh, for uh, multi, dwelling units 4.5 and for uh, industrial uh, buildings and, and community buildings a quota of uh, 20.9 with an increasing trend so that's all that is a good good uh, signal of course let us look on the example berlin potsdam so in potsdam around berlin so which is indicated here in, in the red color we have uh, 43 percent or let's say 44% of agricultural areas and the rest is uh, natural area and forests or so lakes. Forests uh, in, in detail are covering 4.6% of the vicinity here. And uh, with this, we can create a possible yield of 720,000 uh, cubic meters, so which is around 500,000 tons. And this is sufficient for building flats for about 25,000 people per year. So it's a huge, huge amount. And you may have also heard about uh, the Schumacher Quarter, which is planned on the old airport Tegel. So in, in the context of the urban tech republic, there they are planning 5,000 flats for 10,000 residents. 
when we take into account the, the, the standard lifestyle in Germany in the moment, we have to assume a size of these flats of 95 square meters. And then you can avoid around yeah, 460,000 tons of carbon dioxide by this quarter alone. It is not much in comparison to that what Germany is emitting, but it is just one part of the solution. Yeah, so is, um, as I said, so uh, forests play an important role in terms of storage uh, of carbon dioxide. And um, uh, when it comes to timber construction, you have to apply a kind of an, a gardening approach. So in the sense that you use the forests in a sustainable manner, or in other words, you should only extract what can also grow a year. So and when you look on German forests, we can uh, expect, or they are responsible for around 60 million tons of carbon dioxide fixation per year. So this amounts to, uh, is, is equivalent to seven to, uh, to seven to eight percent of the German total emissions. Um, yeah, so the question is now, uh, can we use um, this um, amount also for, for, for timber construction purposes? Of course not, yeah, we, because, uh, because we need the forest um, and, and um, we cannot uh, cut them all because of biodiversity and other issues. So when we talk about these points, we have to, to think about additionality. So what can be done when we, when we look on afforestation? So in Germany, we are, have a, uh, an annual afforestation rate of around 5,000 hectares uh, per year. So that's not much, but of course, uh, with this, we can, we can uh, create an additional effect. But coming back to the total uh, potential of German forests, you may see here what, what we could, could achieve when we like to build um, the timber buildings. Um, so here we did the calculation on the basis of, of a family house. So in the moment we have a quota of uh, completed dwelling units of about 300,000 per year. So this holds for 2020 um, or was valid for 2020, yes. Um, and when we would use um, the uh, timber, so the lawn timber um, only then of course we could build more or less um, the double, so, so more than 700,000. This is a, is a good um, uh, opportunity, but what we have to say here is that 50%, if not more, of all the German timber products go uh, into, yeah, is used for energetic purposes. So they go into ovens or I don't know whatever they do with it. So that means um, we have also to change the economic system a little bit. Yeah, um, storage could be could be tremendous. Here you see an example uh, from Australia. Um, so when it depends a little bit how you calculate it. In any case, you should not take into account only the storage uh, potential uh, of, of, of timber buildings. You should also take into account the avoided emissions, because when you build a house, of course, you would do it when you when you would apply traditional building construction styles. You would use um, uh, uh, brick kilns or I don't know, uh, yeah, concrete, and you have to take into account also this um, this avoided emissions. And when you do this, of course, your 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 um, yeah uh, your potential is quite high. So this is for a single building which was uh, uh, constructed in Australia. Yeah, the question is now whether afforestation can help us here. And um, so maybe that you have read an article. Uh, I guess, which was published two years ago in this article was said, okay, so when we would um, forest all the extra land which we can use for forest, uh, then we have around 1 billion hectares of additional land available. But uh, when you also assume that we have seven tons of carbon dioxide sequestration in biomass per hectare and year as an average, it, it depends a little bit on the region, then you can fix only seven gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And this is just 20 to 30% of the total yearly emissions. Uh, it sounds like, uh, so it is a big number of course, but this would mean that you have to apply to any forest. Uh, so um, uh, a forest area, a forested area worldwide, you have to apply a, a, a decent um, a management style, a sustainable management style for, for, for these forests. 
In total, the uh, storage could be even higher. So for a period of, of 30 years, it's around 205 gigatons. Um, but here you have to wait and see. So you have to wait for the climax um, uh, st status in, in these forests. Yeah? So by this, by, by this example, you may see that it is not so easy as, as people sometimes uh, communicating it. So timber could help, but it is, of course, not the only silver bullet. Um, yeah, so um, we can go into further details. So example, United Kingdom, because they have the plan to do an afforestation or to implement an afforestation of 20,000 hectares per year until 2050. So that's 600,000 hectares. And here we can store around 140,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. The economic benefit is, is um, yeah, uh, is also not so high as just 3.5 million euros when you calculate it in carbon uh, price uh, units. Uh, when you look on the emission savings, so the additional effects, it is just for these 30 years is just 1.3% of the total emissions in UK 2020. Um, so what does it mean? Uh, you should not look only on the forest, what I have said already before, you should also look on the storage potential which you have in the buildings. Yeah? So, and this is what you have to take into account. If you do this, you may see that you can almost double. Uh, so this is a very optimistic number, but uh, with the right technology, I guess it's possible. You can double the storage potential, um, but um, this needs new technologies. This needs new uh, yeah, modularity also for the timber, timber construction uh, units um, and, and many, many more. Um, but uh, as you may have seen or may have heard, uh, so it could be an opportunity. It is one part of the, of the game. So we have also other issues to solve in agriculture, for instance. Um, uh, we have also to take into account that we should deal with, with, um, with local value chains, not with, oh, sorry, with local value chains, not with global value chains. Um, all this is, is, is relevant and, and would increase our, our performance. Uh, yeah, um, but about this, uh, Mark will say a few more words uh, now, and I will finish with my part and would hand over to Mark now. Thank you. Yeah, hello. I hope you hear me, and I hope you see my. Can you see my presentation? I guess I have to stop. It. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Can you see that? Now we can okay. see your presentation. So, so after this, you know, uh, extremely uh, dense presentation by uh, by Jürgen, and not much to add on, of course, on this aspect, but uh, giving you a quick, a very quick overview because we're running out of time about our initiative. I just give you a few words what we actually try to do and the material transition, as we could call it, it's a major part. So. Uh, what our main idea is, um, is our 100 of the years, or now 101 year after the uh, uh, initial Bauhaus, to rethink uh, in a similar systemic, uh, in modern words, systemic radical way of how we build houses, quarters, cities, landscapes. So how do we actually develop the built environment, given, as we all know in this call, but not many people outside actually expert circles, the huge challenges which we have. And the huge challenge just to have uh, the, the three ones, the first one was mentioned several times, all of you know, at the 40% greenhouse gas emission, what we need to consider that actually we are ahead of the largest um, uh, construction uh, project in world history, adding another 2 billion people in the next one generation, uh, mainly of course in Africa and Asia. But if we continue building, um, the build environment as we do at the moment, we will not reach Paris targets, uh, Paris commitments. So this threefold thing, as simple as it sounds, is not part of the major mainstream political discussions. If you have followed the political party discussion, none of the political parties in Germany now, neither in, in other parts of Europe or with the uh, um, new administration US, really has that clear picture in head. Uh, it's not in the agendas. Now, um, so 
of course, you're all experts. So I, you can imagine, just to mention some of the challenges we have, if we want to transform and we think we need to transform it globally, the built environment in the most, um, in the most, uh, in the broader sense, it should, it must be nature based, if we want to call it like, it must be circular. And I just added here some buzzwords, not a concrete list of things which we need to do. And we talked about the biogenic material substitution. We, of course, need to have um, the impact reduction on the full extended life cycle. And I've seen on the agenda, there's something next to our discussion here about how to measure life cycle in a more correct way and with better data. Uh, it needs to be, of course, circular economy building techniques from design phase to implementation to uh, dismantling, if there's any dismantling. Uh, it needs to be, you mentioned that supply cycles and supply chains, which are more regional, but to uh, change it completely, uh, the, the, the supply chain and the whole value chain of an industry is a huge program and it's a huge project, of course, as well. So all on these life, and we could follow on like this, needs to have, from our point of view, three main approaches. We need to have a holistic view, including a narrative, a narrative which gets mainstream. In Germany, it's called Bauwende. Everybody talks about energy transitions or the energy vende and the transport or mobility trans uh, transformation. The building sector needs to have the narrative um, in Germany, in Europe, globally. There needs to be the narrative that there needs to be a real transformation of the built environment. So that's a holistic view. We need to have a narrative, an idea, a picture in our heads. A second point is going a little bit further. We need to have integrated approach from the design phase to implementation, um, which integrates the different parts and aspects, integrates different science and uh, architects, engineers, and so on. So we need a really integrated approach. And this conference today, thanks for that invitation, is a, is a great example of how to integrate different perspectives, solution designs, and we need experiments. Without experiments, we will not make it uh, because the existing technologies and so on is not up to date at all to um, be able to be compliant with Paris agreements. So our approach just, again, it's not a complete picture. It gives you a little bit of uh, a feeling how the approach of Bauhaus is. I just put now four of the, our eight or 10 major topics and they are somehow connected. So we all talk about billing as a carbon sink, as is Jürgen impressively shown you what's in there, how it could be done. It's also about circular cities and buildings, as we all know, but it's also on the right side, nature-based solutions. And for our point of view, an important one, polycentric design of human settlements, which goes, uh, um, which leaves the 20th century centralism um, uh, as part of history, and we need to have a new polycentric design in every aspect. So what, how to do it, just to mention some, some ideas, we need to go systems analysis, we need to go into politics, regulation, we need to have economic strategies, business strategies for new in, um, sustainable environment, built environment, we need labs and so on, and how do we do it? We do it uh, with three organizational elements which is a think tank, so classical think tank. We go, uh, we will build and establish a, a lab, digital and physical, and we will establish a collaboration network of experts. And these three elements should work together. So that's our approach. And here you see just the immense amount of things which really needs to be completely reworked, rethought and redeveloped. It starts with impact analysis and just pick one of them and you can read down the whole list. At the moment, everybody talks about SDG alignments, ESG criteria, whatsoever. There is no global reporting standard which covers the, the built environment. It doesn't exist at the moment. So uh, we were just discussing with global reporting initiatives. Says, That's a great idea. We know it's 40%, but actually we don't have a standard. So it starts already with this, and you can go down all the things, assembly testing, how it actually can, can you do that with biogenic things? Uh, you need, of course, new regulation. Regulation is a major hindrance of um, any transformation at the moment. You need prototypes. You need to think about the economic system of a transformative built environment, because the economic system as built, by the way, it's from 1850. Roughly all the system, how, how buildings are um, built, how it's, uh, the real estate agent, all the system has been below about 1850 starting, and we need a new system here, how to, how to deal with this uh, immense asset of human beings. 
important part for us, equity, dignity, every, and it has concrete consequences for research agendas, innovation, um, screening, and so on. Any innovation, any transformative move uh, in, in, in the rich uh, Western European countries needs to reflect from the very beginning on the effects on, on in the global context. Um, and that one of the key examples how to do it is any innovation should be screened also. Is that an innovation? Is that a transformative move? Which could help in the global context as well? And we want to establish this innovation network, which then spreads and gets in uh, in a, a multilateral directional way um, to have a global network uh, on eye level uh, dealing with these transformation things. So thanks for that. Um, that was a quick run through our approach, adding to the very much concrete and, and, and strategies of Jürgen. And I would leave the floor now back to the moderator. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark Weisgerber, and thank you, uh, Jürgen Kropp. This was very uh, interesting. I have uh, one question to Jürgen Kropp, I, um, if I'm allowed. Um, I know you have been talking a lot about timber and the potentials and so on. Um, have you done and or did you consider the fast growing bio based materials as well? Because I mean, it's also might be um, a, a different uh, perspective to let plants grow very quickly and store them a very long time in buildings. Have you considered this as well? Yeah. Um... Yes, of, yeah, so you can you can do so because yeah, but but what you have to take into account here. So in the moment, the rotation time uh, for forest. So um, yeah, so the, the how long the trees need need to grow so that you can use it is uh, approximately thirty years. Yeah. So this is is uh, almost the standard. In um, in Germany, um, the age uh, categories of, of German forests uh, is more than 70 years. So that means the German forests are quite old. So, or in other words, we are not using it adequately. So we can use it much more often. But however, you only could use um, uh, the same amount of carbon dioxide which is stored per year, because otherwise it would not be sustainable. And here you have some, some um, ecophysiological limits. Yeah? So you cannot store more than seven to eight tons per hectare. Yeah? So this is standard. And on this basis, uh, we did the calculations. And it makes no difference here whether you have fast growing plants or, or, or slowly growing plants. The storage is almost around yeah, between eight to, or approximately seven to eight uh, tons per hectare and year. So, um, yeah, so we, and, and, and we, we uh, define this limit as a kind of a sustainability uh, target, so to say. That means, in other words, you could only extract what, what is growing. Yeah, um, yeah so that, that's, that's, that's all what I can say here. Okay, thank you so much. And Mark Weisberg, Gaba, maybe a question to you. Um, you said that the um, SDG reporting impact ESG wave. I mean, this is uh, especially important for the financial sector and they are jumping now on this, uh, uh, maybe on the track. Um, have you, um, do you really think that the climate crisis is one of the main uh, uh, drivers for them? Or is it, <coughs> what is it that makes people investing now in more sustainable solutions? Well, I would say there's a cynical answer on the idealist answer. Fortunately, there's some convergence now getting to there. Why? Because uh, from a idealistic point of view, there are more and more people also in business and even large business who think, well, I have my kids at home. I somehow think we need to change. The cynical answer is, of course, greenwashing. And then greenwashing um, uh, is, is huge. And there needs to be, actually, there are some organizations who, uh, who there's greenwashing.org, I can only recommend that. It's a small initiative who just try to check, but they can't now work all these greenwashing things. So uh, to filter out what is greenwashing with real impact. I think given that there's a concrete climate physical risk for all companies, including banks who have all these ads in their, in their bank balance sheet, Plus, there's a there's a huge political risk now for all corporates. If they do not change to net zero economy strategies, they will have a problem later on by not being able to re, to to export to China. That was one of the reasons why we have more electric cars now in Germany. It was China because China said we simply do a quota, 
and then that. So there is some movement now where corporates cannot flee completely away, but the amount of greenwashing is still huge. Mm -hmm. Good. Then I hope that the sustainable finance initiative of the European Commission at least is exactly. helping to sort yeah. out uh, yeah. the worst from uh, the yeah. light green ones, let's say it. Okay, um, I will leave it to this. Um, it was a pleasure to have you with us. And um, we leave you now uh, with the Bauhaus, the Erdegi GmbH. I'm, I'm really looking very much forward to uh, talking to you uh, maybe in half a year and a year uh, about um, what has, how far you are until then, maybe earlier. Um, <laughs> so, you earlier. I will. <laughs> Next time I will come to, when I'm in Berlin, I will visit you. <laughs> We're looking forward. Okay. Okay. Thank awesome. you. Um, then um, I will uh, have the pleasure now that we jump into a session on tools. It is that um, tools is the topic. And we start with Dr. Andrew Norton. Um, he is uh, the director of a company called Renewables. Uh, Andrew Norton is an LCA specialist. Um, He is uh, going to talk uh, with us on uh, the sequestration, carbon capture and storage methodology of based uh, um, bio-based materials, sorry for this. Um, and uh, he is also um, consulting um, very interesting companies. Um, maybe I can, I have a question to you afterwards if the audience has no other questions. Um, Andrew Norton, the floor is yours. Hey, I hope you can hear me okay in the presentation showing. Yeah. Yes, okay. both. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and also the invitation to talk at such an exciting and very timely event. Um, as mentioned, I'm a life cycle assessment and materials expert. Um, I've been very privileged to work with some amazing clients and take part in many technical committee and standardization discussions. But as I have the somewhat impossible task of discussing something rather complex in 15 minutes, I'm going to move on rather quickly. Um, in this presentation, I will essentially be looking at why that timber building in the picture is a carbon pool. Um, we're not necessarily interested in why the, there's a wave pool in front of it, at least not today. Um, briefly, I'm going to introduce why we should consider stored carbon in our life cycle assessments and our carbon footprints. Mostly I'm going to be discussing how we can calculate this benefit by looking at some of the methods available and some of the uh, limitations there. But I'm also going to ask where we should be looking at uh, considering this benefit. Now I'm going to present a lot of graphs that can be studied further in your own time. Uh, I believe this has been recorded. You can look back through this. I'll take screenshots, but I hope that will give you a good introduction on the topic and make you aware of some of the issues. So let's look at the importance of stored carbon uh, in construction as a bit of a background. Um, essentially, we put far too much CO2 in the atmosphere before, as, as Jürgen's also uh, already kind of discussed. You have to look back 16 million years ago to find a time when Earth had CO2 levels over 400 parts per million, as we do now. Uh, back then, the sea level was about 50 meters higher. Unfortunately, there's a time lag between CO2 levels and temperature, but we drastically need to do something about it. And that's essentially why we have commitments and pledges by, by world leaders that set us on a trajectory to achieve things like net carbon zero by 2050. This graph being taken from the EU pathway documents. Um, including huge reductions in terms of industrial and power emissions. But timber and bio-derived products have many attributes that help us achieve these goals. They have generally very low environmental impacts, so they contribute very little in terms of industrial emissions. They also substitute high impacting materials um, and using them means low, lowering our energy demand. These materials also store carbon. Um, this increases our national carbon sinks and they provide the removal needed to achieve the net zero we're aiming for. I, they help compensate the emissions we can't be entirely reduced, such as food production and other materials. This is what we'll be looking at today. Now, if we want to, more carbon to be stored, we need to incentivize it. Um, 
firstly, we need to account for the quantity that's stored, but we also need to look at the length of time that it's actually stored for. Currently, we have a carbon sink of two gigatons, um, two billion tons of CO2 equivalent is stored in Europe's residential building stock because of the timber used. Now, our European Sustainable Forest Management essentially removes around uh, half a billion tons of CO2 equivalents per year as stored carbon in the form of wood. Now, that's the equivalent of about 10% of the EU's total emissions, or 20% by 2030. But only 15 to 30% essentially gets converted into potentially long life products. And far more could be reused and recycled. But there's currently very little incentive, certainly in terms of measurement. So in our very much simplified current situation diagram here on the left, we have slightly more carbon storage than if the forest was essentially just left to maintain itself. But it could be far more. We could grow this sink by increasing the amount of biomass produced that goes into longer life storage, particularly in construction, or by increasing the life of these products, but preferably both. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that we stop using biomass for fuel or short life products, as they both replace other high impacting materials and fuels. I'm simply stating that what we should do is at least acknowledge the carbon storage in wood and other bio-derived products as a benefit, especially if we to, to use our resources to best effect. So how do we quantify the benefit of stored carbon? Firstly, to do this, we need a time scale. This is because greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere at different lengths of time. So when we try to quantify their impact, um, they have different effects on climate change depending on what time scale you use. For example, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. It's good at retaining heat. It has what we call a high radiative forcing efficiency, but it comes back out the atmosphere fairly quickly. So it appears to be less potent over long periods of measurement. I'm not going to dwell on this table. It's essentially there to show that we use a 100 year time scale when we consider global warming potential in our carbon footprints and to introduce that concept. Now, I want to use an example of two buildings to discuss some of the aspects we need to appreciate in order to account for the benefit of stored carbon. Now, I had the privilege of working on a project for the, U the UK's Committee on Climate Change, where we could compare real life designs of residential buildings. This example is for a block of 40 flats where cross laminated timber, as mentioned by Jürgen before, was considered for the alternative of a traditional concrete version of the same building. We can see in the impact of all the materials used, essentially above the red line in this graph, showing the global warming potential impact. And also separately, we can see the stored carbon and the timber used in both designs in green underneath the red line, as there's a reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere rather than emission. We can also see in orange the limited impact of the CLT compared to the quantity of carbon stored and the large impact of the cement used in both of the designs. However, what we report in most whole building assessments and our product footprints is simply what's above the line. We don't consider the impacts. We generally don't consider this temporary emission or storage effect. Now here I want to clarify what is a benefit in terms of carbon storage. On the right, plants photosynthesize and turn CO2 into carbon. That stays in the product during its lifetime in the building. Now CO2 is sequestered from the atmosphere, meaning carbon is stored. You'll note that all the time that the carbon is stored, there's less CO2 in the atmosphere, so there's a reduction in climate change occurring. This is a benefit. On the left, this shows a maximum amount of recarbonization re of concrete that's possible. This can only occur if the de demolition includes crushing and exposing to air and water for a very sustained period. And this is, this I must stress is not a type of carbon sink as some people are promoting at the moment. This is just a potential to reduce an impact that's already occurred we should not ignore the potential impact maintained by the building owner during the life cycle of the building. 
So with our timber building, when it's disposed according to our standards available at the moment, we assume at some point the carbon will end up back in the atmosphere at any given point, essentially. So when we report these impacts and benefits in EPDs and whole building assessments based on them, we only report the impact of making the timber building. We do not report this benefit. Transversely, if we assume recarbonation occurs, we potentially ignore a large portion of the impact of the cement used. Now, just taking a very simple example where we would assume demolition of a timber structure at 60 years. Um, what's essentially considered in EBDs or PEF or any whole building assessment based on them is what we call a snapshot. We only report what carbon you are responsible for in the year 100. What we need to do if we're going to incentivize this actual benefit of this stored carbon is to consider the benefit over the time frame we have. We can do this with a number of methods, the simplest being a weighted average, i.e. one year of carbon storage maintained equals 1% of the total amount stored. However, because we calculate a carbon footprint is set up to look at emissions rather than storage, more scientific calculations are quite complex. Briefly, we end up trying to match a curved graph of how CO2 behaves in the atmosphere. This is what we call the burn cycle with a linear stable maintaining um, of the stored carbon, like the straight lines in this graph, these graphs here. So there are a number of theories and methods of how best to represent this. Now, this graph was taken from a paper by Brandeo et al. And it sums up uh, all of the methods that have been assessed and, and, and put forward into the scientific community very well. I very strongly recommend you read the, the the full text if you want to know more. But the straight line, this diagonal in the middle, um, is essentially that one year equals 1% weighted average as per ILCD method or the past 2050 method. Now, other more complex models that account for this curved berm cycle, um, like the Lashhoff and dynamic LCA methods, actually give very similar results to a weighted average, especially if you don't know the exact service life that'll happen. That will have more of an impact than the choice of method you use. Um, now, dynamic LCAs can also be used to look at the, uh, calculate the impact of emissions um, or that, that are later removed, such as decarbonisation. Uh, this will be discussed later in the next presentation by LED, I, I believe. And also note that all of these methods show that at 100 years, we account for 100% of our stored carbon. I believe Matty Goodman's talk later on might touch on this um, as the, the finish carbon handprint is presented. But also note that none of these are perfect. They're all models based on approximations of radiative forcing over a set timescale, the same as our carbon footprints. But what they are is an approximation of this benefit, all showing the user that longer storage increases that benefit. And this is what we should promote. So if you go back to that example um, before the two buildings um, from the uh, CCC study, we take it, take a weighted average um, example uh, method. We can apply this, and what we get is this red line, which are the total impacts and benefits of the buildings. We also show other contributions from the cement, the stored carbon, and other materials. But you can see the linear effect of the biogenic carbon storage, particularly on the, the right-hand graph, where with the cross laminated timber example. We're just dealing with service life um, and how maintaining the carbon storage in the cross laminated timber is more beneficial over longer periods of time. Now, these are the results. If both buildings are designed to last 100 years, but other service lives could be considered. This sort of calculation could invent, incentivize better building designs and recycling of timber in particular. They also show the real benefit of the biogenic materials, not just their low impact, but the carbon storage benefits as well. Accounting for this information would help grow our national carbon sinks. If I was to be asked which method I would choose to use, then past 2050 is a very good estimate. And things like dynamic LCA are very 
uh, slightly more accurate perhaps, but also useful if you know what service life you're going to be considering. So where should these uh, carbon storage be considered? And the impact of construction products are presented in tables such as this, um, in EPDs and PEF, but also whole building assessments like levels. And we can see the separation of fossil biogenic and land use, land use change impacts being totaled up um, into our overall total. But we can add up these uh, not just as per life cycle stage, but as a, a whole life cycle total, and that's where our stored quantity is missing um, because it's assumed to be re relieved at the end of life. I also note that the biogenic carbon there it doesn't state the quantity of stored carbon. It's actually in a table like this, which is taken from an EPD on cross laminated timber um, that actually show the quantity of stored carbon. And it's that number that you can take further and apply a dynamic LCA, a weighted average, um, and look at what the impact would be over the design lifestyle or the benefit. So if you're a producer, you can, produ you can display this benefit as additional information on your EPD. Um, but this is rarely actually occurs because a producer generally doesn't know the service life. And it's quite a rare thing to, to do at the moment. People are a little bit scared to be the first to, to show this. Where we should be applying um, this data and applying these calculations would be in, in BIM programs or in AutoCAD things that are sat in front of architects and, and designers, and also perhaps in our whole building assessments. Even if it's not displayed as the whole building's total global warming potential, but perhaps as further information, one total showing the stored biogenic carbon influence and another without. This way, the designer at least is aware of the benefit to the con consumer. Um, and there's a resource being used with stored carbon that should be maintained. So just briefly to conclude, I'm sorry if I'm coming up to the end of my time. Um, storing carbon in biogenic materials is very much a benefit. Quite simply, it reduces climate change. We need to understand it and report this benefit so it can be incentivized. Now, calculation of this benefit needs to be available to designers and architects, especially in BIM uh, systems and whole building assessment. And if policymakers want to increase carbon sinks, which I'm sure they do, they need to be aware that currently there's very little incentive at the product and building level to do so. So thank you very much for your time. Very welcome to answer any questions. Sorry for all the graphs. You don't have to be sorry for all the graphs. They were super informative. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this uh, uh, very enlightening presentation. Um, I have a look at the chat. There's currently no question, but maybe later in the discussion. Um, I am, have just one question. Since you are all so um, active in standardization activities, um, are you happy that we have these standards or uh, uh, is it too slow or how what can we do to i mean to really speed up um and uh, not lose more yeah. years in discussing <laughs> the right method it's a it's a bit of a tricky um question to answer um there's also obviously in standardization there's quite a lot of influence and lobbying from some very effective um, manufacturers and, and producers um, i don't need to say any more than that i'm quite sure but certain aspects have been not uh, allowed to be looked at and that's that's a great shame so even though we're we're looking at the wood pcr at the moment we very much hope to kind of include a slightly more proactive approach recommending that people do show this kind of benefit on there it's always been in, uh, on there but it, it's not necessarily been 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 uptaken I, I hope it does in the future but the bim standardization at the moment we're very much keeping that door open in terms of the carbon that's stored is quantified and presented in, in bim and the digitization of these impacts from from products so that can be taken forward and calculated in, in programs in the future, which currently aren't standardized. So, I take this task with me. Um, we are currently updating our certification scheme for sustainable buildings. Andrew, if I can get in touch with you to um, have good uh, incentives then for the market, um, I will get to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, now from uh, the island, um, 
to the um, hectagon. Uh, we go to France. <laughs> I'm happy to have uh, Elodie Massé with me or with us. Uh, she is uh, from Atelia and um, she was already introduced by Andrew. Um, and uh, um, Elodie, you will guide us through um, the new French regulation as well and methodology to um, look at the aspects from a more dynamic perspective and how France addresses both uh, the operational and the embodied emissions. Um, and I'm super interested uh, in the presentation. I heard a lot, lot of this uh, uh, proposal, but I haven't uh, had the time to dive into this. Um, Elodie, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Anna and Andrew for the introduction. Uh, I think yes, the transition is perfect because I will speak then about the incentive uh, for changing the uh, the way we, we build and also the dynamic LCA. Um, so first of all, actually, I would like to, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I would like to introduce you a bit about the, the way um, LCA has been introduced uh, in, the, in the French practices in construction and um, how the new um, environmental regulation, which is the RE 2020, uh, which is actually a bit late because it will be out in 2022, but uh, so uh, how it has been um, uh, built uh, from the beginning of the use of LCA uh, in construction in France. So LCA has been introduced in, 2010 as a more common practice uh, to, um, to introduce in, um, in building design. Um, and initially, it has been really much encouraged uh, by uh, voluntary schemes uh, of certification. Um, so you had the very first um, certification scheme, which was HQE uh, 2012, uh, which started to, to introduce the a life cycle assessment of building in the um, in the general assessment, and then um, you had two uh, labels uh, which were issued quite um, so almost at the same time, so BBCA and E plus C minus, and these two labels uh, they were really uh, giving targets about carbon footprint of buildings, so like the uh, and they were looking at the the impact of the of the materials, so the embodied impact, and then also at the operational impact. Uh, but so it was uh, classic LCA, static LCA. Um, and the E plus C minus, actually, it was supposed to be, um, the, so it was a national scheme, and it was to be the preparation for uh, the, new, um, the new building regulation, so the environmental regulation RE 2020. Um, but actually, as I will explain, so uh, this has changed quite a lot. So, um, and the way uh, LCA is approached is, is very different now, uh, as we will talk about dynamic LCA. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview um, on the E plus C minus standard. So basically, uh, it was really two. So you had two criteria assessed. So the energy criteria was based on the uh, national regulation, so the RT 2012, so which was only an energy regulation for building. Uh, and then you had um, the, an aspect about the embodied carbon and also operational carbon. And you had basically th uh, two different thresholds uh, and you could be more or less um, uh, performance. So uh, carbon one was the first uh, uh, for, for the, was the easiest um, uh, easiest uh, uh, level and carbon two was really uh, demanding. Um, and so this actually has been quite a lot used by a private client and also actually by the, so for the new public equipment, uh, because the, so as it was supposed to be uh, the way the new environmental regulation would work, everybody wanted to, uh, to be prepared and to, to try and implement LCA. So it has been really something uh, which was uh, common for, for the new buildings to use LCA as an eco-design tool. Um, so especially focused on, on carbon, actually. So it was not really used as, as a multi-criteria uh, tool. Um, and so then uh, just very quickly, so to, um, to explain the, the context of the 
of the new environmental regulations for building. Um, so it, it's really uh, supposed to, to help uh, the, uh, the achievement of the, of the, objecti of the um, objectives of the national low carbon strategy in France, uh, which is actually, the, oops, sorry, which is actually pretty much aligned with the, so it's uh, based on the, on the European uh, uh, directives. Um, and so what, so um, just to give a quick, um, um, a, a little bit of context about the new regulations. So it would be, um, so it's still, uh, so the consultation is still ongoing. So it, and um, it will start to be applied for housings uh, so in, on the 1st January, 2022. Uh, and for offices and education buildings a little bit later, so uh, in the middle of next year. Uh, and then uh, there will be also other, other buildings coming in the, in the scope um, in 2023. Um, so basically, uh, we have uh, five performance requirements. So today I will focus more on the two uh, related to carbon. But you have one about passive energy design, so more about the envelope of, uh, of buildings, one about primary energy consumption, uh, so one about um, the reduction of some uh, thermal discomfort, uh, which is uh, new, actually, this one wasn't included in the, in the previous uh, energy regulation for building. And then what is really, really new is the two uh, aspects about the uh, environmental impact, so the, the carbon impact on um, of the energy consumption of building and then of the building component themselves, so embodied carbon. Um, and yes, yeah, so now um, if we look at the, the way uh, carbon impacts of building would be uh, assessed uh, uh, by the regulations. Um, so basically there will be, um, so uh, an SCA would be mandatory for all, all buildings. Um, and so we will, um, and, the, and the methodology which has been um, retained and which is actually very new for everyone. So it's, it's a very big change uh, in, in France. Uh, so we, we are going to use the dynamic LCA. So I will show you a, bit, a little bit later how everything will be calculated and what are the, the impacts. Um, and so basically we will have thresholds um, for uh, the different types of, of buildings. Um, so th there will be thresholds. So th the thresholds here are for the, only the, the construction material, not the operational impacts. Um, and uh, so this threshold will be evolutive. Um, so there will be, it will be easier at the beginning and then it will be more and more restrictive uh, so that uh, we have time to, uh, to implement the new practices. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so for, for this, that's it. Yeah, actually just a quick uh, note at the moment, we don't have all the information for uh, the commercial buildings. Uh, we don't know all the thresholds and everything yet. Um, okay, so uh, the way uh, basically dynamic LCA works, so um, it's so the um, that the impact which is considered over time. So it's not just uh, the um, um, uh, like a photo uh, impact which which is taken when we do the LCA. The idea is to um, consider that. Uh, we need to, to do a, a bigger effort now because it's now that uh, the reduction of CO2 is more crucial. Um, and so the, um, uh, the dynamic LCA considers the, the atmospheric degradation of, of CO2 uh, in the overall calculation, um, which means that uh, actually, so. Um, and so there is a, so to calculate this, so I, I won't, so you have studies which explain everything uh, in, um, in more detail. I don't have the time uh, in the, uh, in 15 minutes to present all, um, but the, the idea uh, is that um, uh, using this function, uh, we, we can, we calculate the, the impact differently. So uh, basically uh, I will show, uh, yeah. Uh, if, if we if we take uh, some emissions which have been uh, 
um, made uh, now and emissions uh, which will be uh, made in, in 30 years, for example, um, then the impact after, um, after 100 years from now um, will, will actually be um, uh, so, so, the, so the, the difference of the, the difference of impact uh, will will have um, decreased, um, and so um, if yeah, if we look at what it means for um, for the different types of materials, um, when, when we look at so on on this um, on this graph, you have. Uh, so four different materials, so that's equivalence beams, I mean equivalence of, in, a structural, um, in a structural sense, uh, and you have the comparison between dynamic and static LCA. Uh, so basically, uh, when you look at the, uh, the static LCA as it, so it, it would consider all, all the, uh, the life cycle stages at, uh, at the same uh, level, um, and for example, for timber, you have the last, um, so the end of life, um, which uh, where you consider in the EPD that you, you have wood, which is, uh, timber which is burnt, uh, and so you have a lot of carbon release. Um, but when, when you look at the, um, at the dynamic LCA, so the emission of the, um, so the emission which will be made uh, at the end of life of the timber, which have much less weight um, and making that the, the timber um, really appears uh, as a better choice. Um, so all that means that the, um, the new regulation will really uh, encourage the, so the, the will really encourage the use of bio-based uh, materials. Um, uh, and, and that will be a, a real, so it will really be a big change uh, in the in the practices, um, and just something something else um, in the in the new regulation, which is really interesting, uh, is that there is an additional rule um, regarding reused materials, uh, and the, the rule is currently that all the reused materials which are installed in new buildings they will be counted at zero kilogram equivalent CO2 to encourage uh, circular economy and so material reuse. Uh, and there is currently already a very strong dynam dynamic in France about reusing mat materials, a new construction project. Um, and uh, I just put uh, the, an example here of, uh, so it's, it's a kind of organization uh, where clients, so to which clients have engaged um, to commit to install, so they, so they have engaged to install uh, reuse materials in their new buildings. Um, and doing that, they also contribute to a kind of innovation. Um, uh, it's an innovation pool, um, uh, which gathers all the, uh, uh, all the experience, uh, experiments and so the best practice to, to push for, uh, for the change of practices uh, in the area area of reuse. Um, so what's all that means for, for, the, for the construction is that so currently you have um, a learning phase. So the, the thresholds are not so demanding. Um, so basically all the new buildings will, will be assessed and then of course they will be optimized, but um, the, to, to reach the, uh, the initial thresholds, it will still be possible with um, with class, classical construction uh, methodologies, uh, and then uh, there will be um, uh, so there will really be an effort phase uh, where we will definitely need to implement the new solution, the new low carbon solution, um, and and we will really have to use more timber, bio based materials, in general reused materials, uh, and so the the concrete which is still used will also have to be much more uh, low carbon than it generally is uh, now. Um, and then, the, so it's supposed to be uh, like a maintenance space where the, the practice will have changed um, and uh, yeah, and, and things will, will become more mainstream. Uh, and just a very quick thing, because I know that I, um, I'm uh, running over time. Um, about the, the carbon impact of energy, which is also included in the assessment. 
uh, and also so the, S, the dynamic LCA will also be used to calculate this part, of course. Um, but the uh, the very the interesting thing about this is that um, uh, it will really um, so so we will really have to change uh, our practices regarding energy. Uh, and and the, the main um, so the biggest consequence is that uh, we will have to um, uh, to forget about uh, use of gas in the new construction really because uh, this will be um, so because of the thresholds we, which are uh, given uh, and um, and uh, the data uh, of the the gas uh, it is really something which will be uh, phased out in, in France. Um, yeah. So, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry because there was a, a lot of information, and I know it, it, uh, it takes a bit of time to um, get into the dynamic LCA because that's a, a quite obscure concept. I think at the beginning. So, um, yeah, I hope it was still useful. <laughs> Thank you, Elodie. Uh, indeed, it was. Um, we have two questions, and um, I would like to uh, get uh, Jane Anderson's. Hi, Jane. Uh, your question here. Just one thing, because it's really interesting. Um, if reuse products have zero kilograms of CO2 equivalents from processing, does reuse timber have carbon sequestration? That was in my mind. I wouldn't couldn't have uh, formulated it that way. Ah, the carbon, yeah, at the, at the moment they haven't really considered this. Um. Okay, good. But uh, really nice. Um, I know there was another question, but if uh, it was on, uh, maybe you could get in touch directly, um, uh, Rosanna. Um, you have the contact details. But um, it was a very uh, intense uh, presentation. I have to switch over to the next presentation. Elodie, thank you so much for being uh, presenting this to us. And um, I'm happy now we go further south to Austria. Simona Skalitsky is going to, um, uh, she is um, uh, uh, part of the climate, she's a climate and environmental consultant at the Kommunalkredit Public Consulting, in um, which is working on behalf of the federal government. And um, we here are going to learn something on uh, new buildings and timber construction uh, on the grant from the Austrian Forest Fund. Um, Simone Skalitsky, the floor is yours. I'm very interested in what you are going to present. We can see your screen. We just need to hear you now. I Thank you it's... very much. Yeah. I wish a nice afternoon from uh, Vienna, from the KPC. We are a funding agency on behalf of the Austrian government. Um, the presentation, uh, it's about new buildings in timber constructions. It's, it's a grant from the Austrian uh, Forest Fund. Let's have a look about the background and the goals of this uh, fund. First, um, the Forest Fund was um, passed by the National Council in 2020 and uh, entered into force in spring 2021. For the implementation and for further uh, information, um, a special directive uh, was published. And um, I would uh, like to point out that the Forest Fund is highly endowed with 350 million euros. euros. Now, the, uh, some words about the goals. First, the, um, one goal is the compensation of forest owners for loss of value and consequential costs caused by the climate change, um, in particular by the increase of the bark beetle masses. I think this is one of the most important, important targets, targets because um, it's respectively an overarching uh, objective. Then second, um, the reduction of the infestation of the Austrian forests by bark beetles. Then a third, the development of climate friendly forests and strengthening of forest biodiversity. And last but not least, the strengthening of the material and the energetic use of the raw material wood as an active contribution to climate protection. And this will be the content of our grant. What are the measures? There are um, 
a row of measures. It ranges from the reforestation and care after damage events or the, de the development of climate friendly forests um, until uh, some parts for the research, the research focus, and the research facilities for the production of wood gas and biofuels and so on. But I would uh, particularly like uh, especially to point out one measure, namely the uh, initiative Think Wood. I will uh, give you an overview about uh, this initiative in the following slides. The timber initiative uh, includes um, some models of measures and uh, the motto of the initiative is um, build a sustainable future with wood. You can see we have um, here some uh, two headlines, um, the material use and the energetic use. And um, especially I would uh, point out the timber constructions. The timber construction includes the carbon dioxide bonus, then um, some tender guidelines and um, feasibility studies. This measure about timber construction will be discussed in the following. Here we have um, the, the, the main slide uh, for this initiative. It's, um, uh, it's, it's the, the, the special part, what should be funded. There are wooden buildings, um, the funding is a part of a comprehensive package of measures along the value chain, forest, wood, paper. And uh, we have already heard it, the, the background is to increase the use of wood as a raw material and as a building material. What are the subject matters? Um, the subject matters are new buildings or additions and in extensions of already existing buildings but only with a high proportion of new renewable, renewable raw, raw materials from sustainable management. And we call it this uh, carbon dioxide bonus. Um, especially we have uh, two kinds of buildings. Uh, they are founded. First, multi-story residential buildings from 400 square meter net floor area and at least for residential units or buildings for public purposes or public infrastructure with a net floor area of 200 square meters and more. Uh, now a slide about the beneficiaries. Who are the beneficiaries? Um, this could be natural or legal persons, including local and regional authorities from federal states or municipalities. So we can um, have uh, the, the companies or non-competition party participants as uh, beneficiaries. And um, what are the special requirements for these beneficiaries? Um, yes, we have uh, a minimum amount of wood and energy requirements. So you can see we have, um, um, or the, we, the demand is at least 100 kilogram of wood used per square meter net floor area. And then we have um, for residential buildings and not residential buildings, um, some special values um, called in Austria, HVB, RefRK value, and then we have FGG uh, um, value. These are uh, special factors from the energy performance certificate in Austria. And um, what uh, very important is that um, no fossil heating systems are allowed in these buildings. How is the calculation of the support? Um, the support goes up to 50% um, of the total eligible construction costs and up to Maximum, maximum up to up to 200,000 euros for companies. 
um, in the context of the de minimis funding or up to 500,000 euros for non-competition participants. And um, the calculation is one euro per kilogram wood used or one euro 10 cent euro, uh, one per 1 point cent euros per kilo wood used when you using at least 25% uh, of insulating materials made from renewable raw materials. Um, these are materials from wood, especially, but no reed and no hemp and, and, and other materials from, from the nature. So it must be raw materials from wood. Um, important is that uh, it is no combination possible with other federal or state and municipal, municipal funding or other special grants. Now a slide about the basis of the calculation. Um, the basis are the built-in solid wood products and wood-based materials and uh, structural timber products with a pure wood content of at least 80% of the product. Then insulating materials made of wood-based materials. Um, so insulating materials from fossil sources are not, uh, uh, don't count in, in this grant. Then uh, the facet cladding made of wood based materials as a part of the construction of thermal insulation. And wooden roof and interior wool coverings of wood and, um, but only if they are a necessary component of the roof or of the exterior wall construction. And last but not least, we um, have the flat wooden roof structures with an inclination of less than uh, 20. Uh, degree because steep roof constructions are um, usually made of wood and they are not a special part of the timber constructions. Then we have um, some qualitative requirements. There must be either a certification according to the program for the endorsement of forest certification called PFC or of the Forest Stewardship Council called FEC. And um, the last quality requirement is that at least 80% of the timber used was harvested and processed within 500 kilometers from the construction site. Here you have an um, overview about um, the time scale. Um, we have uh, calls and uh, the first call ended last week and the second call st already started. Um, then the KPC is um, responsible for the formal and uh, content check of the calculation and of the funding amount. Then after, afterwards, an expert commission um, has to decide about um, the ranking of the projects. Um, and especially there's a quality evaluation necessary for the ranking of the projects. It's part of the expert commission. Then uh, the approval of the funding application follows. And afterwards, the funding agreement and the declaration of acceptance. And last but not least, uh, the completion of the requested timber construction um, uh, takes place and find the final settlement and the payment of the grant uh, follows. And here we are, the buildings are erected. So you um, have um, an overview about the contact. Um, responsible is the Federal Ministry for Agriculture, Regions and Tourism with the business area of wood-based uh, value chain and uh, responsible for the funding processing um, is, uh, we have already heard, the Common Equity Public Consulting in Vienna. 
Um, this was a, a very short overview. I hope you have um, some interested slides uh, for you. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Simona. This was very interesting um, to see. Actually, um, it is nearly a policy instrument, which will be our next sessions. Um, so uh, my very short question, there was a big discussion in the background, but rather on Elodie's uh, presentation before. Um, but my question would be, is, uh, are you considering, or is this also in line with the Sustainable Finance Initiative um, and activities from the European Commission? Are you aligning it? Uh, this sustainable in initiative is um, not aligning with this uh, grant. This is um, um, a special grant uh, from the uh, Minister of Agriculture, um, and uh, this there is um, um, no possibility with uh, combinations with other fundings. Okay, good. Um, I have uh, one hand that is up, uh, but Mati, you know, this will be away. We will take it away from your time. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. We have, um, is it urgent? But you can, you can ask your question and then we have a little bit of shorter break. Mati. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, uh, to Simon, a, a kind request that if you have any studies in which you would have calculated the overall climate benefits of boosting forest uh, wood construction with this help in comparison to the temporal loss of carbon sink in forest in, on the Austrian scale, that would be most interesting for our policy discussion. So mm -hmm. if you have anything in, in English or in German, I would be most interested in reading. Thank you. Uh, can, can you send me email and um, I will send you um, our calculation. We will connect you to Tillman. I, mm -hmm. I know we have to know. Thank this. you very much. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Mati, for your question. Thank you, Simone, again. Uh, we will have some time for discussion at the end. Uh, now we have a little break. Um, Tillman, I have to look at you. We are a little bit behind, but we have this buffer of a, a presentation that is uh, a little bit different than we thought before. So the break is actually planned until uh, 40, but let's make it to uh, Tim, with... you fine with 45. Yeah, I would say so. I think it's good for all, all to rest a moment. Uh, maybe uh, Simone could answer one last question uh, from Simon Kirby from the ASPP. Um, maybe it's a uh, very quick answer. Uh, how many applications uh, there were in the, for the first call? He asked. So maybe this we could. Uh, um, I, I, quickly. When I remember correctly, uh, 54. Okay, thank and you very it's, much. And um, uh, it's about 7 million uh, euro funding. Okay, great. Then we all take a break until um, 3.45 um, Central Eastern time. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, good point to mention. Minutes. Yeah, see you in a minute. <laughs> so the time is it's time to come back to sit back down on your chairs in front of your computers and now we go we came from the UK over France to Austria now we go way north to Finland I am I'm talking a little bit to wait for the clock to say it's 45 but i'm super happy to have mati quittenen with us um mati i saw mati already this morning in our national um uh regulation uh round of the world gbc uh initiatives on the built environment um mati is uh from the ministry of environment uh, in Finland. He's also professor at the University of Aalto. Uh, Mati is an architect and um, I know that also Mati is the super specialist in uh, all carbon related questions and I am happy to have you with us. Uh, you will present um, the Finnish approach on um, uh, transforming the policy towards um, yeah, a carbon um, 
I have maybe a climate positive fin Finnish future. Um, and you will talk about the carbon footprint and carbon handprint uh, um, proposal, actually, or regulation that you are providing. So I spoke enough. Mati, the floor is yours. And I'm super interested to learn from you again. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Anna, for these kind words of introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, greetings from uh, rainy Finland. Let's go into our uh, presentation. I will just share my screen. So indeed, I work at the Ministry of the Environment. That's the ministry who is in charge of all construction related regulation and also climate and environment related regulations. So I think that we have a nice uh, policy package inside uh, one building. So uh, uh, some, uh, some words about how we are planning to become carbon neutral. We have set ourselves rather ambitious political targets that we are aiming to carbon neutrality in less than 14 years and then we aim to become carbon negative shortly thereafter. Now, just this year, uh, actually a month ago, our uh, government was uh, having their uh, revision of their plans. And it may be that we, we if things go re really well, we can become carbon negative even before 2040s, but let's see. The idea, of course, for all of this and how this relates to forests and wood construction is that we wish to imitate the beautiful natural carbon balance in the forests, in, in beautiful Finnish forests, we have a nice balance of photosynthetic uptake of carbon and release of it back into an atmosphere in its oxidized form through decomposition and plant respiration. So this is what we wish to do in the built environment to a certain extent as well. And therefore, we have figured out that maybe we need to look at both sides of the equation, both uptake and release of carbon. And the release of carbon, that's what we are about to tackle through setting limit values for the carbon footprint of buildings. And we don't yet know exactly on which year this would get into force, but before year 25 anyway. Then for the other side of how to store carbon into the built environment, we are planning and we have also already drafted incentives for increasing climate benefits that wouldn't be there without a construction project. And we call these carbon footprint and carbon handprint. And these, of course, are not strictly speaking scientific, very exact terms. But since this is a big leap for the whole sector, we thought that it might be good to have something that doesn't sound awfully technological and nerdy, but that, that's easy to recall and easy to compare. So this requires that we will take the full life cycle approach into building norms, taking a look at the, the entire life cycle of buildings. And uh, now in the climate declaration of a building, which will be the, uh, for, uh, the, the forthcoming mandatory tool uh, for, for following the balances or, or flows of carbon over the full life cycle of the building, we'll be reporting the carbon footprint side or the emissions caused by building over its life cycle. And here, here there will be a mandatory uh, need to declare these emissions for all buildings that require a building permit. And then there would be specifically set limit values for new buildings. And naturally, these limit values uh, most likely would decrease then gradually over the years towards our goals of carbon neutrality and carbon negativity. Then the carbon handprint side, a, that's the potential climate benefits. And, and indeed, it's based on ENI and ISO standards. And then you, there you have your several aspects that I will cover a bit later in the presentation. But the important thing is, is to, that we will report this separately, because these are not, these don't match timely. And these don't necessarily match in terms of their accuracy and uh, uncertainty. So therefore, we see that it's, it makes no sense to claim that if both are equal, then the carbon building would be carbon neutral. So we don't have a definition for carbon neutrality of the building. Then uh, maybe it's good to check quickly that which parts of the building are included. We are taking basically everything into account. Uh, of course, we have rather well defined the level of detail and accuracy that would, would have to be uh, like covered in the climate declaration. 
Then in terms of the life cycle stages, uh, we have everything that's related to material production, everything that's related to construction uh, phase, then key components of the use phase, the replacements of building materials and operational use of energy for the first 50 years of the building's technical service life. And thereafter, we uh, we include everything that we can for the for the end of life of buildings. And uh, we also uh, follow a scenario of decarbonization for the operational use of energy, and that's set in accordance to our national energy and climate policy that we also use for for uh, like following Finland's goals of becoming carbon neutral. So it's in line with with the national climate uh, policies as well. But maybe it's good to, to think a little that why are we suggesting that the, in addition to the carbon footprint, we should also start talking about carbon handprints. And uh, the first reason is uh, I've, that I would like to offer is a psychological one. I don't think that we make enough progress if we all the time focus at the problem and if we just try to be a bit little and little less bad. I think that we should try to be much less bad, but also tremendously more good. And um, we can do this. We can calculate the carbon handprint. Uh, that's actually a term that we set a set, the set of indicators or measures that you can draw from E and, and ISO standards. So as we do have the calculation methods in place, why would we waste the creative potential of architects and engineers and environmental consultants in only trying to mitigate the emission size without looking at how to increase such climate benefits that are truly measurable and that are not greenwashing. So I think that there is a great, also a, a incentive from the cent, uh, viewpoint of uh, innovation. And then I think that another good reason for this is to the aim of trying to get become carbon neutral and carbon negative. As we look here, the annual greenhouse gas emissions and removals in Finland from the statistics, as we try to go towards carbon neutrality, of course, we have to balance emissions and sinks. But especially where we, when we are pursuing carbon negativity in 2040s, or all like additional increases in, in ways of storing carbon into the built environment are much needed. And of course, our forests could be the primary uh, sink for carbon. But then again, as we know, in, in many European countries in which forests replace a, a vital role for gross uh, domestic uh, product, production, and, and that's an important part of the Finnish economy that is keeping our aging society up and running, so there are limits also to, uh, or there are difficulties in significantly increasing uh, the non-use of forests. And therefore, I think that uh, we will need to find new ways of storing carbon into forests, but perhaps also into the built environment. And in order to just to explore this a little bit further, uh, I actually did with my, my colleagues from Ruhr Universität Bochum from Germany, a small exercise in which we went through all the scientific literature that we could find and, and made a survey or a literature review of all different possibilities of storing carbon into the built environment. And surprisingly, there are rather many of those. So of course, uh, we all know the potential of bio-based materials and composites. Some of these are age old and some, of some are just emerging like algae-based composites or mycelium-based composites. But then uh, what we have perhaps uh, slightly forgotten is that the plants and especially herbaceous plants in the cities, these have also a, a, an important role and this would have to be taken into account as part of the, the solution especially if we could boost uh, the accumulation of carbon into soils. This might have a rather inexpensive, this might be, uh, be a rather inexpensive way of storing carbon into the built environment, and that would then help the pressure on the agricultural and forestry sectors. And especially if we enhance this uh, accumulation of carbon into soils with so-called enhanced weathering, we could even gain larger benefits. 
Then naturally biochar is another wood-based or bio-based material that can be used in both green infrastructure but also as an uh, as an additive into cement, uh, uh, asphalt and uh, concrete and uh, other products that makes very very long-lasting uh, carbon storages. And this is uh, this is actually ancient method used in in Brazil, for instance, thousands of years ago already for agricultural purposes. Then, of course, we have the uh, chemical reaction of carbonation into cement-based products that we shouldn't forget. Uh, then we have some sci-fi looking uh, high-tech solutions like direct air capture of carbon dioxide, which also has uh, yielded good uh, results in, in some German examples. I believe that in grocery stores, they got rather good results in store, uh, like capturing carbon from the exhaust air of ventilation machines. But artificial photosynthesis at the moment doesn't seem that promising, but it is still there on the lab scale. And then, of course, we have the carbon dioxide based plastics possibility for, let's say, frost insulation or for plastics that we used in a municipal infrastructure, as well as the super interesting possibility of curing concrete with carbon dioxide. So there are lots of things that we can take into account in addition to the traditional ones. At the moment, uh, we are uh, proceeding with our national wood construction program. We have set uh, percentage targets, uh, like that, that how much we want to increase wood construction. And in a few years, we, we plan to have 45% uh, of all public buildings made from wood. And uh, according to our uh, calculations, uh, in, in our context, the wooden buildings store typically from 150 to 300 kilos of CO2 per square meter of course, depending on the structural solution of the building. Then in order to reach this, uh, we have uh, gathered the essential toolbox that includes an assessment method, which is of course compatible with EU's levels method. Then we have a generic national database called co2data.fi, which is actually in English, if you want to look, it, look at that and all the background documentation. And then what is most important, at least at the moment to us to make this fluent is the digitalization compatibility of building information modeling with life cycle assessment. So if we can't get this running, then this uh, LCA remains uh, a pleasure of the academic sector and will, will not get mainstreamed, which would be a pity. And to close with, I would just like to share you with our next goal. We would like to start mapping the carbon and material flows in the built environment through different scales. So we would like to understand how greenhouse gas emissions and renewables are flowing for, through buildings to cities to country level on, and to European level and how renewable, non-renewable and recycled materials are flowing in, this, in these different scales. And for that we are currently preparing a digital platform. So with these I hope that we can uh, uh, reach our political goals and now if you have any questions or comments I may try to answer to them or then get back to you in the chat. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mati. This was uh, very encouraging as well um, to see such a actually brave and um, well thought um, proposal actually on the table. It's more than a proposal. You already have tools and data uh, in the implementation with BIM. Um, I am looking at the questions, but um, there was one from Jane Anderson again, uh, whether or not refrigerants um, mm. are regarded uh, because you have uh, taken out uh, B module B1 out of your scope. Maybe it's not a topic in Finland, but it might be in future when it becomes warmer. Yes, uh, it, it's it's a topic in, in supermarkets indeed. So, so Jane, you have a good point there, but at at the moment, it doesn't show in the radar in other types of buildings. And but but as Anna, you pointed out, this might be something uh, in the future as as the cooling needs increase. However, there if we only would if uh, I think that um, to be in uh, to be logical, if we took B one into account, then there would be other things in in B one to be also looked at. And for instance, the, the carbonation of concrete during the life cycle of the building is rather tricky in. Um, uh, to define exactly at the design stage and then what can the designer do about the leakages uh, if 
because the design solutions don't affect so greatly the, the refrigerant leakages in B1. Okay, I won't get lost in the details, but yeah, we have considered that, but it doesn't seem to be relevant. But uh, if you have some data that we uh, that that you have from there, I would be most interested in looking at that. Okay, thank you so much. And actually, um, the finished proposal is a very good one um, uh, with the handprint um, that all the sort of benefits um, that are currently neglected in many calculations um, uh, come up and uh, will be part of decision making processes. Mati, I thank you so much. I hope uh, you will turn back now to your students, I heard, uh, maybe if other questions I'm sorry come. For that. No worries. Um, it's very important uh, to work with young people. Um, good luck with your students, and uh, it's uh, we have to work for them. Um, thank you, Mati. Talk to you in uh, soon. Um, we now have. Uh, I hope to pronounce it correctly. It's <laughs> rule rule ball. Is it rule? Yes, that's correct. Rule ball. Rule, rule ball yes. from. Yeah the Netherlands. Um, he is a um, member of the uh, Bioeconomic uh, Bioeconomic Federation of the Netherlands and um, actually um, we have we were we are going to get a, a no presentation but a speech from you on um, promotion instruments of the administration for bio-based materials, which is very important, I think, um, because it's really um, how administrations and the public body um, uh, acts uh, in order to be, uh, yeah, to be the front runner in a very difficult transformation that we're all in. Um, yeah. So um, the floor is yours. Um, okay. Maybe you can save up some of the time that we have lost uh, with the other. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be able to give a speech uh, on this subject because I think it's very important. The building sector uh, has an enormous potential uh, for uh, carbon storage, but uh, it's also very complex. I think that uh, I'm involved in the bio-based economy since 2004, so, so many years, uh, of which many years in government. And uh, what we see is that uh, there's a difference between what we want to reach and how we reach it, our goals. Uh, we have to consider uh, this as a transition and it's not easy, uh, for instance, to enter the market uh, with a bio-based product and be successful. Um, the building sector, building and construction sector uh, is rather uh, complex and it's considered by many as too conservative even though we have uh, good examples of, uh, of change. But, uh, but there is uh, much discussion still about how this sector could speed up. Uh, they say it's supply driven, risk avoiding, fragmented, and also the legislation is not helping in general. So, uh, it's complex to, uh, to change uh, things and for the Netherlands situation there is also the problem that at the political level several ministers are responsible. So for to, uh, to reach uh, new goals it's very difficult to, to get there. What we did in the past, in about 10 years ago, was to introduce the instrument of green deals. And this green deal uh, starts with a sustainable initiative by a group in the private sector. And uh, they, uh, on the other hand, there is a commitment from government side to help this initiative as much as possible. We have uh, started this in, uh, in 2012 and we have uh, uh, started this with the idea that if possible we could remove 
barriers in legislation, if possible. We could uh, improve the accessibility of the networks and we could uh, exchange and uh, promote the dissemination of knowledge because uh, very often there is a lack of knowledge with uh, other partners involved uh, when it comes to uh, the application of bio-based materials. We have uh, now, uh, in general, uh, more than 300 uh, green deals completed 10 years uh, after, of which were 30 were bio-based related and uh, 25 were construction related. And I would like to focus especially on one uh, deal that we started in 2013 on uh, bio-based building. Uh, more than 40 companies were uh, involved in it and together with uh, knowledge institutes and the, the ministries, the three different ministries that were involved. At first, uh, there was uh, defined what is the problem you face. Well, the problem is there is no level playing field. Uh, between bio-based material producers and the uh, traditional tr producers. Um, also, bio-based products are not well known. Uh, the concepts were uh, not so clear. There was a lack of data. And what we uh, tried to do is uh, to improve that situation. Uh, the problem was the legislation uh, still uh, hasn't been solved fully yet. Uh, and that's about uh, the calculation of the uh, carbon sequestration in, in wood and bio-based products uh, in housing. But probably that will change, uh, that will be adjusted uh, in the near future. What is important that uh, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, knowledge exchange and that has been significantly improved. Uh, very uh, useful uh, website has been uh, set up uh, with accessible knowledge on uh, materials and building methods. Uh, the website Biobased uh, Building uh, uh, was uh, set up with information uh, and uh, many, uh, it reflects also uh, the different projects and the products and all sorts of articles. But as I said, uh, the problem of uh, the legal, uh, legal issues, it's very complex and uh, sometimes uh, it's very hard to change uh, the legislation uh, in this area. In that respect, I, uh, I looked uh, with admiration to the situation in France, because I think uh, that's a very good example of how through legislation you can uh, speed up the, the transition to more bio-based economy. Another, as I said, the Green Deals, they work very well in itself. They help to, uh, to bring parties together. Uh, on the other hand, uh, also important uh, to assist companies uh, is by procurement. Uh, procurement is uh, very important in the Netherlands. Uh, public procurement, uh, is about 70 billion euros a year. Uh, so that's quite a substantial uh, amount. And in the Netherlands, we have an experience center, uh, an agency of our Ministry of Economic Affairs that supports uh, companies uh, and buyers to, uh, to uh, increase uh, their uh, bio-based purchases. Um, they help also uh, to uh, 
to, to them to access the, the markets. Uh, we have also in that framework of uh, the procurement concluded a, a green deal on uh, bio-based products. And what we did was uh, we brought together the purchasers and the producers and uh, had discussion together with them on awareness to develop a common vision uh, to cooperate and for next stage the, the implementation and the maintenance and that has led to trust between parties because uh, as I experienced, if people don't trust each other, then your ideals may be great, but you won't get them implemented. And I think that's uh, that approach uh, to have a lot of discussion to get the culture uh, together, uh, to have uh, exchange of knowledge. I think that creates the perspective for change. And uh, very often I see that the discussion on bio-based is uh, done at a very technical level, uh, but that's not enough to realize the, the change uh, you want to see. So therefore, uh, I really suggest that uh, we do not think of what we want to reach only, but we also uh, need to think on how we would like to achieve our goals. And very often uh, that is lacking. And we have to face also not only uh, the willing, uh, but there are also still many unwilling to, uh, to act. And they have sometimes very strong lobbies. So therefore I think uh, in general, when we talk about climate change and transitions, it's very important to invest in people. And therefore, I'm also very happy with the situation in the Netherlands where we have uh, this co-sponsor, Agrodome, uh, with Fred van der Berg, who is playing a very good role in, uh, in this transition. So what's next? I think uh, actually in line what, uh, what the French uh, representative had suggested, I think that for the Netherlands, uh, we would like to see uh, mandatory targets for, uh, for bio-based products in buildings. I think that's uh, the easiest way forward. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think we also need to invest in people to get the message better understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, this was, it's, it's, it was actually quite good that you did not have a presentation because sometimes you just look at the presentations and now we really had to listen to you, which was very intense. <laughs> so thank you for not presenting PowerPoint slides. <laughs> um, it is a good mixture. Um, I have a question to you. Um, because the Netherlands, as a very resource scarce country, is more known to circular um, practices, uh, especially from the building uh, sector. We always, from a German and, and other European countries, look at the Netherlands and um, say, wow, in circular building, you're so far and this is so far and so good. Are you, do you have the feeling like, uh, you know, the two concepts, uh, bio-based and circular, um, is it uh, competing against each others? Um, no, and no, no. No, it's uh, fully the same. Uh, if you look at uh, circular, uh, they have an organic part and an organic part, and the organic part is bio-based. So it's, uh, there's no difference. Uh, but uh, uh, so circular and bio-based, uh, I don't uh, care too much. It's uh, the movement is in the right direction. Okay, but that, this is very encouraging. And um, thank you again for highlighting the importance of investing into people 
especially also time um, to talk to them and explain the way. Um, I have not seen questions from the audience yet, maybe later. Um, I think it was very enlightening, but also um, you said that it's important to have a strong regulation to make it going faster, like the French yes. ones. Um, well, with that's this, not enough. It's not enough, yeah. Um, and with this, now we look at Wallonia. Um, I would like to have Magali de Proust um, with us. Hello, Magali. Um, she is from the Wallon Public Service. And um, actually, your title of the presentation is quite long. But anyways, it's on tools, projects, policy, and financial support for the development of a value chain for regional bio-based building materials in Wallonia. And um, this is, I think, very uh, an important um, presentation for us when we talk about policy um, that we learn also from from uh, from this one. So, um, Magali, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, so I'm working uh, for um, Sustainable Development Division as a, as an architect, as you as you said, and I will present you. Um, so yeah, in only 15 minutes, so it quite, it, it's quite short. Um, I will present you different initiative in Wallonia, um, showing how the bio-based building material are considered into the, the policy project, but also in different tools. So I will uh, present uh, you that in two times. First time about uh, the government strategic plan, um, and in second instance, uh, the different uh, tools that make possible this uh, translation, traduction into the 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 field and the concrete project so uh let's go into the the first um the first part of the presentation so about the uh, strategic plan of the Walloon government uh, so the first one is the regional policy declaration uh, so it's um, the engagement of the government for the five uh next year um, so this includes different uh, aspects. The first aspect is the Alliance uh, Employment Environment for Renovations. In this plan, uh, the bio-based materials are, uh, of course, included. The second one is uh, the, a big renovation plan for housing um, and also for public uh, building and uh, schools. And so in a, in a, through all this policy into the, stretch, the regional policy decla declaration, the, the, the materials, the bio-based materials, the promotion of the bio-based materials uh, and using of the local materials is, um, is promoted. In fact, this, um, this uh, promotion have two, uh, two aspects, there is two goals behind this. The first goal is, uh, of course, to stimulate the low environment and impact solutions of materials and, and of systems. But the second one is also to stimulate the local production because um, perhaps you know that, but in Wallonia, we have several bio-based building material producers um, and also several timber companies. So the idea is to, by stimulating the bio-based materials is also to stimulate the production chain that are in our territory. And um, so there is a economical motivation behind this also. Um, a second plan for the government is the strategy of on long-term renovation. Uh, this is perhaps something you know because it's uh, a strategy that is man, uh, mandatory at European level. So each region and each country have to have its own strategy. Um, into this strategy, we have different aspects, including the bio-based materials. First is developing inno innovative and sustainable building materials. Uh, and systems, so stimulating the production chains. And the second aspect is to promote the, the bio-based and also the sustainable materials. The next one is about is, uh, Circular Wallonia. So this is the strategy for circular economy that we have in Wallonia. Um, the, this plan works on different value chain. 
Um, and one of the, this prior um, value chain is construction. But the plan also includes an approach of the bio-based economy through all this value chain considered in the plan. So um, we have a specific working group into this uh, strategic plan working on the bio-based building materials. Uh, so the goal of this uh, working group is to find how to reinforce the production chains uh, that we have in, in the Wallonia and to massify the using of these uh, local uh, materials. Um, the last big plan of the government uh, is, uh, was um, approved in the context of the pandemic. Uh, it's the recovery plan of the regions. Um, and you can see that in this plan, the second axis is focusing on the environmental sustainability um, in a more detail, developing a market of low carbon products and services. Um, so indeed, the, the, the building sector is, uh, of course, an important stakeholder of this plan. Um, especially after the floods that we had in, uh, in July, as, uh, as in Germany, um, and the need of rebuild buildings and infrastructure in Wallonia. So the idea is really to focus on uh, the building sector. So we have a big opportunity to include at this level environmental uh, aspects and also uh, carbon storage. So um, now um, let's see about um, the different tools. So how to implement concretely the political ambition in, into different uh, tool and uh, supporting. So the first one uh, is the final support from the, from the regions to the different citizen. Uh, it's an insulation bonus for households. So this, um, this um, insulation bonuses exist in uh, Wallonia for years, but from uh, 2019, the, a specific bonus exists for uh, bio-based insulation. So if you put some bio-based insulation into your home, you can have an extra bonus from 25%, so which is a, a nice support for this uh, solution. The next one is about the public buildings. So the Walloon Society for Public Housing uh, is now working on a frame contract for building of new public housing. So, and they really wanted to include a sustainable approach uh, in this project and make a focus on the building with low environmental impacts. And so they, they imagine to use the bio-based um, buildings as uh, an extra um, to give a bonus points, let's say, to the bio-based solution um, into the, the attribution of the public procurement. So this is something quite interesting to follow. For now, it's not yet done, but it's uh, ongoing still. Uh, the next one is um, a, a specific subsidy for uh, insulation of uh, public buildings. The name is Ureba. Uh, so this is um, a program that exists from, uh, from years in Wallonia, but the last call um, in 2021 includes um, um, uh, an extra subsidy for bio-based solutions, so also 25% extra subsidy for um, public owners uh, for all the bio-based solutions. And when I say bio-based solution, it includes uh, materials, but also uh, windows. So the next one is a label called bio-based products. So it's a label that also exists in France. So it's the, the same principle uh, that we have in Wallonia. So it's a private initiative. So not uh, by, by carried by the region, but, but um, the, um, the idea is to have um, a, a promotion to, uh, to, to focus on the bio-based solution, but also local uh, chains uh, for the production of um, materials, building materials. So um, the criteria are the same that for the installation bonuses. 
Um, but what is quite interesting in, in this approach is that the, the producers that receive this label take the engagement to make an EPD uh, in the year next to the, from the year after the labelization. That, so that's quite uh, interesting to introduce the um, environmental global impact of the materials also. This one, the CCTB 2022, is um, a standard specification document developed in Wallonia for all the building uh, public procurement. So this is the, the yeah, reference document, let's say, for public procurement. Um, and uh, we decided to screen this document and to see how the material produced in Wallonia, so mainly the bio-based materials, were represented into this uh, uh, reference document. And um, we, uh, for that, we uh, fix different producers, and um, we, yeah, we remark that a lot of products were not into this main specification. So we decide to make write, uh, make written the um, the specifications for these specific products. So you can see on the screen three different examples. For example. Uh, ISOM, which is a product based on uh, hemp, concrete hemp specifically. Gramiterm, which is, I think, uh, include in the Nature Plus Week. Gramiterm is producing insulation uh, panels based on grass. And Pytech um, made um, uh, houses, a building with uh, timber and uh, compressed uh, straw. So these three products were added in the standard specification of the, the CCTB, so the or standard document of reference document, but of course it's because it's public procurement, it's more like a generic specifications, but in fact it's based on this uh, specific product that we have in Wallonia, that are produced in Wallonia. Uh, this tool is some a tool that I know very well because it's uh, my own project. Um, this is a, a tool developed by the three uh, regions of Belgium. Um, this is um, a, a tool that works on the that is based on the LCA. So I I think it's not necessary to precise what it is because Elodie explained it very well. Um, so, but here it's based on a static LCA. Um, and uh, the tool gave an aggregated score for building element, but also building for the environmental impact. Um, so for the moment, um, Totem is a voluntary tool, but we, so the three administration, are really preparing a frame uh, for future, perhaps, regulation, including energy and materials, so a holistic approach of the environmental impact of the buildings. Um, and about biogenic uh, and bio-based materials, um, the last version of the norm of, for, for the LCA, uh, we, we adapted the tool and now the carbon storage is, um, is counted uh, into the calculation. But uh, indeed, as um, I don't remember the name of the, of the guy, but that explained that oh, the balance for us, it's, it's, it's uh, put to zero. Uh, it, this is because we have uh, LCA, static LCA, but we decide um, to, to show the carbon storage as an extra indicator. So in parallel of the, the score, the global score given by, um, by Totem. So this is one thing. And the other one is that we are working on a specific label to show in our library, the old uh, materials uh, have a specific label for the bio-based materials. So this is something that will happen in Totem in the next few weeks. Um, and I think, yeah, if you have some extra uh, question about this tool, I'm, I'm available, of course. Um, and the last tool is a CO2 uh, performance ladder. So this is a tool based on the um, on the other on the similar way that they have in Netherlands. So they have exactly the same principle, but uh, we are um, working on a three region um, tool like that in Belgium also. So the idea of the this ladder is to is a certification system for the construction companies. 
So in fact, they receive a label depending on the efforts they made for the managing of the construction site, managing of the transports. And in fact, depending on the, the level they have on this ladder, they receive um, a reduction of their prices uh, during the procedure for the public procurement. So if they have a very high score, uh, of a very high uh, level in this ladder, they have a, a bigger re reduction on the price. And at the moment, you compare different offers in the public procedure, uh, but you have you can have an advantage. So finally, a company with a higher price, but with a best level into this ladder, can have a better um, a final um, ranking, and so perhaps they can gain the. The, the procedure because of the efforts uh, for reducing the CO2 emissions. Um, and I think it's the last one. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open to your questions. Thank you, Magali. This was uh, very, uh, more than I expected actually. <clears throat> um, and um, I have a question of the uh, approaches you just presented, which of those were are the most effective ones or where do you think like you know this is something another country because we have different countries here um, you should just take it copy this is so easy it has a big effect is there something that you really would like to highlight about the project yeah yeah i i think the totem is is probably the the biggest one because uh the particularity of this project is that a, a three region project. So if you know a bit Belgium, you can imagine that it's something um, very, uh, how can I say that, very nice. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we, we really think that the potential of this tool is quite large because uh, the assessment of the environmental impact of the materials into the buildings it's something uh, really new, um, but into this tool, we, we talked during this um, afternoon about different aspects of the sustainability of buildings. So there is, of course, the carbon storage of the building. So the possibility to include some bio-based materials and all the benefits that they have. But there is also different aspects of, about sustainability that we try to include into Totem, for example, circularity. So uh, refurbishment, uh, we use materials. So this is all, some aspects that we really try to implement also in the tool. So we try to have the more holistic approach of the environmental impact of the building. So I think for that totem is quite interesting. So you can introduce some reuse uh, materials. You can introduce the fact that some materials can be reused at the end of the, of the life cycle stage. So yeah, I think it's, uh, perhaps a more holistic tool that we have now and because it's a three region tool and because we can have a regulation based on this tool, I think it's probably the one important tool for the future of the building in Wallonia and in Belgium. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, from an architect, uh, I hand over to a civil engineer and we come to our last two presentations. Um, the first one is really on a material and the second one afterwards is more on full buildings. Uh, Rainer Blum is the next one to speak. Rainer Blum is head of application technology at Gutex, uh, which is a bio-based bio uh, material for insulation. And um, Herr Blum, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. This means you are not able to unmute yourself now. Okay. Ah, Good. yes. Now okay. we can hear you. Very well. <laughs> Alles klar. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much. Um, just a moment. Uh, now I lost the control. Now it should now it should work. Yeah, I can't open my screen to to uh, share it. Uh, this is a problem. Can you try again? I just changed your status, so it should. No, be I, I, I now. Do, do not see. Just a moment. Yeah. So otherwise, we would have to. Ah, no, no, no. 
I, I, I have to come in again. Sorry. Okay, um, maybe, Frau Fritz Kramer, would you be okay with presenting <laughs> before? I, I try to, okay? Okay, great. Okay, next but, try. <laughs> so, uh, next start. But be, uh, while you are presenting or preparing your presentation, I can um, say something uh, on uh, <laughs> For you, so Dagmar Fritz Kramer, she is director of Baufritz. Uh, it's a company, a prefab uh, company, but you're go I think you're going to present it in a minute. Um, and um, so uh, you are uh, actually uh, entrepreneur of the year 2008. And I'm pretty sh sure that with your um, new, uh, or I would say with your proposals, how to um, build buildings different, you would be it in more in other years as well. Uh, Frau Fritz Kramer, um, if you are fine, then you can present and then we take Rainer Blum. Yes. Thank you. Can you see my screen? I can see it. Perfect. Okay, so I start. Yeah. Yeah, we are Bau Fritz. I am Dagmar Fritz Kramer. I'm the first generation of Bau Fritz. The company is based in southern Germany. Uh, in Bavaria, and we are just 125 years old. So my grand grandfather founded the company here uh, in 1896 as a traditional carpentry. And uh, I just um, give you some facts of Bofritz at the moment. So yeah, we are based in Algoi. Um, you see maybe some uh, mountains. <laughs> So we're family owned since um, 2025 years. We have 400 employees. We're very proud of 30% uh, woman rate. So uh, for a building company, it's quite much. And we have 30% apprentices. So we're just uh, looking for new young people uh, to uh, be involved in the, in the wooden um, industry. So in 2020, we did a turnover of 100 million euros. That means 200 houses that are produced per year. Um, and the, the delivery areas are uh, mostly Germany, Switzerland, Great Britain, the Benelux countries and Austria. Oops, excuse me. So here are some samples of our products. We mostly produce single homes and also apartment homes. Um, this is our market, but we're also known as, as very hardcore ecos in Germany. So we're producing eco homes since the late 80s um, of the last century. So we are just uh, a bit experienced about um, building wooden eco houses. So as you all know, the building industry causes uh, not only in Germany over 50% of the mountain of trash. So um, there is um, this, uh, absolutely, um, this is a fact that we should uh, not um, um, continue <laughs> in the future. And also we use um, too much resources to uh, actually build our homes. Um, so um, we have uh, the, um, the idea to produce our products and design them in circles as a, a cradle to cradle product. And um, as you all know, in Germany, we only recycle 7% of the material that we use in Germany for building. Uh, so there's a long way to go, I think. And um, yeah, how should we deal with these challenges that you all talked about uh, in future? Uh, and um, as Baufritz, we started with our people. So uh, we uh, are EMA certified since 20 years. We were the first uh, company, building company in Germany, which was, which was uh, EMAS certified. And we have also flexible working homes. So new work is nothing new for us. We have our own kindergarten. Uh, we have our own health management. 
we have a very healthy work area here. We all um, work in eco-friendly um, uh, offices. And also we have a company in the company which is called the Young Generation. And it's a company only ruled by our apprentices. So they do their own um, products as um, small houses for rabbits or something like that. Also eco-friendly eco, uh, homes for uh, small uh, animals. So this is a little, uh, some, some um, impressions. This is our kindergarten. These are our eco-friendly um, offices. And this is the company in the company, uh, the young generation. So um, also we have to care about our environment around here. We are CO2 neutral company for three years now. Uh, we uh, manage our uh, own energy where by 100% um, natural el uh, electricity, we produce uh, our energy by ourselves. We also have our Baufritz forest where we plant uh, some of the wood that we use um, and uh, we do active climate protection. So this is... Um, these are some impressions of our, um, here you see the, the PV, um, that where we produce our energy and also our products um, hopefully are uh, stuffed with PV, PV. And this is um, uh, an impression of our um, climate wood, our own forest. So the, the biggest part of, um, the thing that we do are, and the most important thing is uh, our product. Um, and um, I think uh, we have developed a lot in the whole um, uh, time. And um, you all know the rules for sustainability and we try to um, use them every day. So, um, it's very important that the, the product um, is also sustainable and also marketable. And um, so this is the biggest challenge. If you, um, if you aim to uh, a sustainable product, you also have to market it and it has to be also affordable. And so um, I show you some of our products that uh, we developed um, in uh, the few in the last 30 years, I think. Um, and one of the, the uh, important thing is our cradle to cradle insulation. It's made of wooden chips. Um, and uh, also we use no glue and no foam in the whole um, building because if you want to rebuild it someday, you have to uh, reuse the material and also put it all um, together again. So we also work with BIM data for all used materials so that we know which material is in the building and uh, can be reused sometime. So we have a long cooperation, successful cooperation with Nature Plus. Um, and um, the, the wooden chips uh, insulation is a, a certified product by Nature Plus. Um, it was one of our first certified products. Um, we also have our own developed wall paint um, that is uh, completely free of emissions. Um, also, we are the only builder in Germany who have certified uh, building system. All our building elements that we use and uh, produce here in Elkheim are um, certified. Uh, and, bloop, bloop. and we also um, launched a new label for healthy homes 
um, which um, tests all um, emissions uh, in the house and um, or every building uh, that we build for our customers is certified uh, with this label. So, yeah, how to continue? <laughs> There's still a long way to go, I think. Um, and we um, focus on digi digitization because um, it's the only way to know what material is in the house and can be refused, reused again. So we need a digital flow of the material sometime. Also, we have to care about our generations. We have elder and we also have young people here working. Um, and we, if we don't bring them together uh, in a good way, um, there's no future, I think. And also we have, a, have to have a balanced profit uh, because we have to invest some things. Uh, we are still are um, working on some projects. So we, we um, also have to do some or earn some money. So, and um, also we have to care about cycles. And this is, I think the, the biggest, um, problem in future, we have lots of old material uh, in the old buildings uh, and we don't know what's there. And um, I think uh, if we want to re reuse them at one time, we have to analyze them very more. So let's leave us the world a bit better than we found it. And uh, I think this, um, this, um, is one thing that we should all um, care about. So for our children, these are mine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This was very nice, a nice presentation. Now we know your children as well. Um, I have a very specific question maybe on the reuse and the cycling part. Um, are you planning to uh, use reused materials in the near future? Yes, we guarantee um, that we take all material back from our, um, from our customers. They can bring us all material back. We, we didn't get any house uh, uh, back yet. <laughs> uh, we just built about um, 3,000 houses, but none come back. But uh, if uh, uh, one house uh, comes back one time, we can reduce, reuse it here. Um, we know all material that are in it, um, and I think um, we will be uh, maybe very happy to get this material because it's very um, it's very uh, um, yeah. valuable. Yes. Well, at the yeah. moment, yeah, it's very it's very uh, uh, expensive at the moment to mm -hmm. to buy new material. So um, it must be more interesting to get the old one. Maybe you can convince uh, some of your customers to move uh, somewhere else so you can use uh, their building. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> to nicer places. Okay, okay good. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank there's you. No, <laughs> there's no questions from the um, in the chat yet, uh, but maybe in a few minutes. Um, Rainer Bloom, maybe we can Now try. I'm ready, yes. Uh, you are everything ready now. seems to work. And uh, perhaps if uh, I may uh, share my screen, there's still the screen of uh, oh, Fritz. Perhaps uh, Ms. Fritz Rama, could you take it away? Fine, thank you. Then I hope you now see my screen, correct? Yes. And we Fine. can hear you, 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 we can see it. Then I'm very happy to show you our thoughts about how to support a more climate friendly building process with our wood fiber insulation boards. First of all, we are we already heard reuse, but pre-use is also important. This is our raw material. Uh, we are able to use material which seems to be waste of the uh, normal timber industry, but we can use this for chips and uh, then for the fibers. So um, it makes it more worth 
to trade with timber, with, with wood-based uh, products. Um, wood fiber boards or wood fiber insulation material, I must say, because we also have mats and loose fiber. Um, wood fiber products are used in a wide span of applications. Um, this um, uh, picture shows the possibilities, rigid underlays, uh, plaster baseboards for attic systems, interior insulation, floor insulation, all this is possible. Um, it is an engineered wood product, or we are speaking about engineered wood products, which may be um, um, profiled for special demands. And if you use these materials in a consequent way, this means for about 75 cubic meters of insulation material may be used, um, of course, in different products for a single family home. This on the other side means that we are able to store carbon um, in an amount of about 28 tons. Um, in such a house, uh, and we are speaking about a lifetime over 50 years, typically 75, 100 years. I'm living in a uh, uh, partly timbered house, uh, and it's from 1871. So, yeah, a very long lifetime is guaranteed if the construction uh, is done well. And if the, uh, the behavior of the people uh, living in this house is um, uh, quite well. So this means on the other side, we have a potential to compensate emissions per person of more than three years. I found the number of 7.9 tons per year, uh, year in 2019. So mm, this is a huge potential to really do carbon storage. But of course, we want to strengthen the lifetime of products and of our raw material. And first step, we are already doing our long-term practice here in the Black Forest. Uh, we recirculate our um, waste material uh, already into our production process. This is a whole production process, but we are able to take material, waste material, uh, sorted out material and bring it back into the process. We use this internal to avoid waste, but we already use it for uh, our or external for our customers as a customer service we are taking back rest material of regional processors so we are able to bring in these this material as shown in these pictures it's delivered like this to our plant and here we have a special mill which is able to refiber the material to bring it back into the process Timber-based construction and especially our wood fiber boards are typically mounted and fixed mechanical. So they may be detached from the structural shell. And of course, these detached products are still usable. Now we are speaking about reuse. Um, they are functional. And sometimes, of course, it may be necessary to use them in an inferior application, then they may be strengthened by an added product. For example, if you have rigid underlays and uh, all the holes um, yeah, uh, are not very useful uh, for the rain tightness, then add a foil on top of it and th then you may reuse the original rigid underlays already living for 70 years, another 70 years with an additional foil in the same application, or you separate uh, the plaster from plaster boards, and then you may still use this board as a pressure resistant floor insulation material, for example. 
very important for this idea, you, we should do this regional. Regional handling is possible and should be done. Just to show that it is possible, that it is really possible uh, to separate plaster from the from the insulation board. Uh, please follow these pictures. Uh, first, you cut uh, the plaster level because of the uh, reinforcement inside. Yeah, and then you strip it off. And please note, you still see the printed name, the signature of our board. So it's very near to the surface of the board. This board still may be used in an inferior application. But of course, at some time, we have to think about the end of life. And then wooden based materials altogether still have the possibility to use them as a substitution product to, to generate or to, to uh, win energy. Uh, as the substitution of fossil energy source then still is a very interesting aspect which should be taken into account. And principally, wood as the resource of our products already realize a natural material cycle. So we see three possibilities to use um, our wood fiber insulation material uh, in, uh, in the aspect of carbon potential. We have the possibility to capture carbon, as shown. Uh, we have uh, the possibility to avoid carbon uh, or uh, carbon dioxide um, emissions because of the insulation itself as, as a material. This reduces the necessary heating cooling energy. And of course, the new aspect or the newer aspect, which has to be uh, um, um, uh, followed uh, the reuse of material by um, separating it uh, at the end of first life circle. Um, and at the end of life, we have the substitution, the thermal use instead of fossil energy. Also, this aspect makes it a very interesting material. Yeah, I hope this uh, very short uh, uh, presentation uh, had some interesting aspects and I think we are on a good way with our um, um, wood-based panels. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Rainer Blum. This was also very nice to see how it is uh, just happening. Um, so, um, there are no direct questions, um, but what I really liked uh, about the day now, we had only three minutes left. Uh, we started with a presentation um, that was uh, super um, scientifically based um, uh, on the, uh, you remember, uh, I have to look back, Andrew Norton, um, uh, after, of course, after the fantastic keynotes, um, but we had then Andrew Norton presenting uh, the sequestration carbon capture storage methodologies. We had LOD with uh, a nice presentation she had to leave earlier on um, the French um, approach uh, on the dynamic LCA. Um, we have uh, seen uh, policy proposals from Finland with a hand, not just the footprint, but also the handprint, which uh, makes it easier to promote the sort of benefits of using bio-based materials. Um, we had um, now a presentation on the materials themselves and how it is done. So um, I am super happy about the symposium. Um, but um, of course, we still have maybe two minutes left. If there's urgent questions uh, to the speakers, please, please, please um, raise your hand uh, if you're able to do this, and then we can unmute you. Um, but we already had some discussions in the chat. Uh, there's some urgent questions, or is everybody just aiming for a late coffee. 
there is a question actually to Mr. Bloom, which is uh, good that you also have one. Um, a question from uh, Barbara Bauer from Ibu from Austria. Um, is there a delivery bottleneck for wooden insulation? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, there is. Uh, we are all working very busy in our industry, but uh, the demand on products, wood fiber products, is much higher than estimated. And of course, in the next year, in the next years, additional uh, production uh, possibilities are installed. And um, if the timber structure market grows, I think the wood fiber market grows equally uh, because of the possibilities of the material <laughs> and because of the very uh, symbiotic uh, aspect uh, uh, of timber constructions and wood fiber, wood fiber insulation material. But yeah, there is a bottleneck at the moment. We still are uh, fully out of uh, possibilities. <laughs> yeah, but this holds true for the whole building industry, honestly. <laughs> there seems to be a bottleneck in everything. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, Tillman, can I hand over to you now? It's five o'clock. Yeah, so um, thanks for for this very nice moderation, Anna. Really, thank you very much. And now, yeah, actually, it's um, my part just to to do a short wrap up of this very inspiring um, symposium. At least I found it very inspiring. So um, thank you so much to all speakers really for this um dense expert knowledge really so reliable that there are already reliable calculation tools that there are smart smart supporting policies and programs and that there are um, materials already ready to apply so i would say let's get it done um so again thank you so much also thank you very much to our two sponsors Baufritz and Gutex, and I'm very happy and pleased that we could also um, could hear a little bit from their work today. Um, what I also would like to mention that um, this uh, symposium is also part of a project, um, what is called construction materials transmission, what we right now run and what is very kindly financially supported by the um, German Environment Agency and well, in the end of the federal environment ministry and now just um to give you here the information about the um next events within our how to build climate protection nature plus week with all our nice hosting partners aspp acrodome eos ebo and fiber um yeah in the chat we will put the link where you can register if you haven't done it yet and here you find the contact links. Also, if you have any further questions also to the speakers, just get in touch with us and we maybe can um, put you in direct contact with the other speakers. And now I would say that that's it for the moment. We would leave this um, channel a little bit open so that if you would like to copy your information of the chat, you still have the possibility to do so. And yeah, well, uh, for the final word, Anna, I would hand over to you, if you this like. Is, thank you. This is very nice. Uh, thank you, Tillman, for inviting me, for having me as a moderator. Um, it was super inspiring for me as well. And I wish you all um, that, uh, yeah, sort of you, you are inspired as well. And that from tomorrow on, um, we will even... Uh, more work on the necessary climate transformation that we need. Thank you, Tillman. Thank you all for listening and asking questions and presenting and discussing. <laughs>